Last day we were talking about bioenergetics and I'd finished off talking a little bit about ATP and I had said that ATP is used for something called cellular work. So cellular work. So some cellular work is obvious like what we're seeing here in this, uh, uh, in this slide. We can see things are being pushed across membranes so you've got the ATP being hydrolyzed and you've got sodium and potassium, for example, moving across a membrane. Uh, we also have other things moving, such as muscle contraction, or in that uh, bottom example, you can see we have uh, some vesicles are being moved around by motor proteins. So that's a bigger, big part of cellular work. The biggest part of cellular work is something called energy coupling. So what I wanted to do for you today was uh, draw a little diagram, uh, kind of give you an example of energy coupling. I think maybe I have a mini slide on this uh, coming up here in a moment. So uh, if you take a look at uh, what I mean by energy coupling is uh, you have all these reactions in a cell, right? So many reactions are exergonic or catabolic, meaning they produce energy. So we eat food, let's say we eat a donut or whatever, it's you're gonna consume some carbohydrates and some fat in those macromolecules. And as a consequence, we're breaking them down and making ATP. To make ATP, you need ADP and inorganic phosphate. So we take that ATP and we use it to drive endergonic processes. So we build new things. And as a consequence, the ATP is broken down and we're making ADP again. So what I wanted to do is kind of show you a specific example of how these uh, reactions can be coupled. And this is uh, uh, glutamine synthesis. I think I have uh, a little slide there. Uh, it says you can check out figure 8-9 in the textbook. Uh, I do have uh, a little bit more detail to give you in, in the image I'm gonna draw, uh, draw. You can see it says here, ATP passes off a of phosphate, energizes one molecule, and allows a reaction to occur. So I'm going to switch now to the whiteboard and draw you some chemical reactions. So I just got to do a new share over to my whiteboard. Hold on, that's not the right whiteboard. I meant to go for this whiteboard here. There we go. Okay, energy coupling, in my example, is the synthesis of glutamine. Okay, so I'm going to draw for you glutamine, or actually I'm gonna start off by drawing glutamic acid. So here's an amino acid here, this is glutamic acid, and I will label it here in a moment. Just gotta draw the whole thing out. So this is an amino acid. It has, on the right is that carboxylic acid group, and on the left is the amino group. It's also attached to a hydrogen. And then it has a bunch of carbons and hydrogens and it looks something like this. So two carbons in a row. And then on the bottom, it has a functional group called carboxylic acid. So this amino acid is called glutamic acid. And if you're interested in short forms, the short form for glutamic acid is GLU. So I'm just going to erase that and fix that D for you guys. There we go. So there's glutamic acid. And if we want to make glutamine, we need another amine group. And where do we get that? We get that from ammonia. So this is what ammonia looks like. It's a nitrogen. There's some electrons. We have some hydrogens, so it looks like that NH3, that's ammonia. So the chemical reaction, you basically combine these two things and we get glutamine. So I will draw glutamine for you now. So glutamine is mostly the same, but we've got to add that amine group somehow using the ammonia, and it gets added down there at the bottom. And we get something that looks like that. We also get 
water produced. So this here is glutamine. And the abbreviation for glutamine is GLN. Okay, I'm just gonna make this a little bit smaller. I have one more piece of information to give you for this reaction is the delta G value. So this goes back to last day. If you remember, we were talking about delta G. Delta G is the free energy of a reaction. So that's the usable energy, meaning energy not lost as heat, but energy that can be transferred to other chemical reactions. And so the delta G for this reaction is plus 3.4, and that's, I'm just gonna slide that over just a little bit more, and the units are kilocalories per mole. Okay, so remember when we have a positive delta G, positive delta G means the reaction is not favorable, Or another way to talk about the reaction is to say that it needs energy to proceed. It needs energy to proceed. There we go. Okay, so this is a problem. We want to make glutamine. Uh, we have the means to do so. We have butanic acid and ammonia. But how are we going to do this? We are going to add some energy. So what we're gonna do is add the energy in the form of ATP. So uh, I'm just going to shrink this just a little bit. It's hoping to keep everything on all one whiteboard. So hopefully I think everybody can probably see that just fine. And now I'll show you what the reaction of ATP hydrolysis looks like. So ATP hydrolysis, we have ATP and we add water and it gets broken down into, so remember T is for tri, and this gets broken down into diphosphate, so ADP plus inorganic phosphate. Okay, so this reaction here, delta G, is, I have a number here somewhere, I can never remember exact numbers, minus 7.3 kilocals per mole. Let me just move that over a little bit kilocals per mole. So what we're going to do is uh, you can see we have two reactions, one's negative, one positive, and there should be enough energy here to drive this reaction. So what happens is uh, we're going to take the coupling, we're going to couple this reaction here, uh, the hydrolysis of ATP, and we're going to couple it with, I guess that's number two, sorry about that, it should be number two, we're going to couple these two reactions together. So I can't remember whether this is Chem 101 or Chem 102, but uh, where, where you, uh, you add two reactions together. Maybe you did this in high school with half reactions for metals and whatnot, but it's kind of the same idea. We're just going to add those two things together and make one big reaction. So in our big reaction, I am not going to draw all the structures all over again, but in the big reaction, if you take a look, we add these things together. And let me just, uh, maybe I'll grab the green. Notice one thing does cancel out. The water cancels out on both sides of the, uh, of the equations. On the left side of the equation, we get glutamate, GLU, plus ammonia, plus ATP. And then on the right side of the equation, we get glutamine plus ADP plus inorganic phosphate. Add these things together and overall the reaction has a net delta G of minus 3.9 kilocals per mole. So that's what energy is coupling is all about. Uh, I will not ask you to do one of these on a midterm. Uh, you may have to do something like this for chemistry, uh, but what you do need to know is you do need to know uh, what I had talked about last day. What is a delta G? What does it mean if we have a positive or a negative value? 
Uh, what do I mean by energy coupling, right? So be prepared to answer some sort of question like that on the midterm. Uh, you know, these could be not long answer, but definitely either short answer or multiple choice or something like that. You know, I could see a, a true and false question saying, a delta G, you have a reaction with a delta G of plus five, this means it needs energy to proceed, true or false. And in that case, you would say true. Anything with a plus delta G needs energy to proceed. And often the energy is in the form of ATP. Okay, so that actually kind of finishes off topic uh, eight. And we're gonna go right into topic nine. And topic nine is dealing with enzymes. So you can see this is kind of just the last slide of topic eight where it says, hey, you know, look at all these reactions. All these reactions have delta Gs. They all have, uh, some of them need ATP, some of them produce ATP, and they're all catalyzed by enzymes. So that's why we're gonna talk about enzymes. I actually have them included right into the same PowerPoint. Uh, if you download those notes, they're all one PowerPoint, although I do have them as separate notes. So let's talk about enzymes. And um, this is just, again, another uh, short lecture. And then uh, next day, we're gonna start talking about respiration. So hopefully these two lectures give you enough of a basis so we can talk about respiration in a, in a decent amount of detail for Biology 107. So you probably you know, have in your head from high school that enzymes are, here's the words, they're biological catalysts. So what does that mean? Well, biological means has something to do with a cell or a life form or something like that. Catalyst means it is something that speeds up a reaction and isn't changed itself. So in chemistry, you might have a catalyst, uh, for example, a hydrogenation reaction. Uh, you can use nickel and that's a catalyst or, or palladium. Uh, in biology, most of our catalysts are proteins. And so that's what an enzyme is. So if you take a look, this is, this is the enzyme sucrase. So sucrase breaks down sucrose and breaks it down into glucose and fructose. So we have a disaccharide and now we have two monosaccharides. And actually that would take a long time if we didn't have enzymes uh, for this to break down. We're looking at something like you know, years. Uh, but in your mouth, uh, sucrose breaks down in milliseconds into glucose and fructose. So much, much quicker. Notice this reaction is energetically favorable. Enzymes can't change the thermodynamics. They can only speed them up. Uh, here's some other example, another example here uh, from my own research, uh, an enzyme called penicillinase. And uh, I'll show you why this is significant. If you take a look, there's penicillin. So penicillin is a great drug. Um, if you had strep throat or pneumonia or something, you've probably taken penicillin of some sort and it's probably saved your life. Uh, not that stable. If you take a look at that, it says its half-life is about 84 hours uh, in a human body. Uh, so it breaks down. But if you are the bacterium that is trying to make you sick, your lifespan is like 30 minutes. So the drug is more stable than the organism. It kills the organism and we all get better. Uh, some organisms have come up with these, this defense, this resistance called a penicillinase. So penicillinase is an enzyme that digests penicillin. And these are super fast. Some of these have been clocked at like a million molecules per second. I don't even know how anything even diffuses that fast. Uh, but these degrade penicillin very, very quickly. And so this is one mode of resistance that a lot of organisms have is they have a penicillinase. So you can see the kind of speeds we're working with very, very fast. So just a couple of conventions about these things, right? Uh, You've probably seen this kind of thing before in chemistry. Uh, you know, usually in a reaction, you have the substrate on the left or substrates, and you have products on the right. Uh, sometimes we might say reactants on the left as well. And then what goes in the middle? Everything else goes in the middle. So you might have a catalyst. Uh, sometimes there's other chemical uh, uh, conditions. So in chemistry, maybe you talk about something getting boiled at 85 degrees. Most life forms, we're looking at things that are going to be 30 to 37 degrees. So it's information about the reaction, but it's not, it's some things that don't get changed in the reaction, which is what the enzyme is doing. It's not getting changed in the reaction. So the catalysts, uh, how do they do what they do? Uh, I have a note or two to write about this in a minute. Um, 
But uh, basically what they do is they have uh, a place called an active site and that active site will bind the substrates and they are going to lower the activation energy. And, uh, and you can see there's a whole bunch of information there which we're gonna pick apart a little bit. It says lower the energy required for a reaction to occur, aligning things properly. So I'm gonna show you some graphs here uh, for starters, just to kind of get you an idea of what is going on with the reaction. And there's some things that we talked about already. So just take a look at the beginning and the end for starters. We've got some reactants and we have some products. So there's our chemical reaction. And we have some thermodynamics right there. We have a delta G, so this is a negative delta G. So this reaction is downhill, it's favorable. Uh, it's not gonna have any issues in terms of thermodynamics. But most reactions have something like this called an EA or an activation energy. Uh, so try not to get too confused because I've noticed that activation energy seems to have a different symbol in different textbooks. Sometimes you see it like this. Sometimes you see it like this. Sometimes you see it like this with a special little symbol beside it, a delta G with a little symbol beside it. Um, it's the activation energy. It kind of is like the spark to get things going. So you could imagine, you know, maybe you are at the top of a hill on your skateboard or your bicycle, and so you have lots of potential energy, but you just need just that little push to get things going. And that's what activation energy is. Some reactions have much larger activation energies, which mean they need a little bit of a larger push. So what enzymes do is they mess around with that activation energy. So you can see here, uh, the black line is a normal reaction, and this red line here, this is the reaction with the enzyme. So it's kind of just uh, maybe a little bit of an alternate route uh, is one way you can look at it in terms of the chemical pathway. And there's a few ways that enzymes do that. And like I said, I have some notes we're gonna take uh, in a minute. If you go back to my bicycle or skateboard analogy, uh, you could think of it as, uh, you know, you've got the main road and maybe there's another bump that you have to push over and it's a little bit harder. And then you've got the enzyme way, which is kind of a side path, which is, uh, a lot easier to, to access and you can start going down the hill right away. And that's what enzymes do. Like I said, it's the same beginning and the same destination, but maybe a little bit of a different pathway to get there. There we go. So I have a little uh, video here I'm gonna play for you. Uh, and this is, uh, just gotta make sure I share the computer sound. Um, this was uh, made by the textbook. It's um, I don't know why they haven't updated these. You'll see the quality is kind of a little bit low, uh, but uh, this guy kind of explains reasonably well what I was just talking about and I thought it might be worth it for you to hear the explanation of someone else's voice. So I'll play this for you and uh, if I can get it going, it's only about a minute and basically, like I said, talks about what I just said. Oh, it says media not found. Okay. Well, I guess I'm not gonna play it for you. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, must be on my old computer. I did have to switch over computers this year uh, for all this online stuff. So anyway, uh, I'll see if I can find that for you and I'll include it in the PowerPoint when I put it up on Moodle. Uh, so I will get back to those concepts in a moment. Uh, I just wanna say a couple other things about enzymes is there are different types of enzymes. There are six groups. Uh, you don't need to know these groups, uh, but you can see that chemists have taken these and looked at them and decided there's six, six type of reactions. So if you take some biochemistry, you're going to learn about these reactions a little bit more. You can see there's oxidoreductases. Those are oxidation reduction reactions. Transferases that transfer things. So they move, so let's say, a methyl group or something from one molecule to another. Hydrolases. They cut or make bonds, do, dealing with hydrolysis, so water molecules. Um, there's lyases, these cut things not using water. Isomerases, they switch things around, uh, so they make isomers. And then ligases join things together, usually using ATP. So don't worry about the different classes, but just know that they can be classified, and there's different types of uh, reactions that enzymes can do. Another thing to take note about enzymes is that they usually end in A's. And usually there's a clue in the name of the enzyme about what it's doing. So you can see my first example, hydrolase. So when I see hydro, I know it has something to do with water. And these are involved in hydrolysis, so water breaking. A DNA A's definitely has something to do with DNA. And in fact, many times 
the substrate is right in the name. So you can imagine if I had a lipidase, that's something that digests lipids. Protease digests proteins. There's the lyase. I don't expect you to know that one. Uh, again, that's a little bit of chemistry for you, but uh, you can see it does have a specific term that means something to chemists. Oxidoreductases are things that are involved in oxidation and reduction reactions, transferases, isomerases, we mentioned those already, and ligases I mentioned as well. We are going to talk about ligases when we talk about DNA replication. So that's a good one to know eventually. So let's talk about that active site. Uh, as I mentioned, the active site, that's where the catalysis actually occurs. And you can see in this diagram, we've got the substrate, it's getting bound by the active site. And so what is going on there? That's kind of what we want to talk about a little bit today. So there's another example. You can see all these, these active sites. They almost look like uh, little mouths or they're little clefts. I kind of, I kind of think of enzymes as little Pac-Man type characters and they're munching up these substrates and you can see there's some diagrams there of, of some different proteins. There's lysozyme. Uh, I wanted to point out lysozyme because this, pro, this enzyme here does not end up with A's. Uh, so it's kind of a unique thing. There are some uh, exceptions. This is, it has historical reasons. This was one of the first enzymes I ever characterized. So it was just named before we had that convention to use A's. There's another one, a DNA polymerase. You can see right in the word DNA polymer. It's making a polymer of DNA. So I want to show you this picture because what is going on in the active site? The active site is a pocket and it's recognizing the substrate. So if you take a look at this here, we have a molecule called RUBP. We're going to talk about that in photosynthesis. But notice this has amino acids, in this case here, a histidine that is making a hydrogen bond with this oxygen here. So we have complementary chemical forces, right? For example, over here on the right, we have a positive charge and a negative charge. If you had a hydrophobic component to that molecule, there would be, it would be a hydrophobic pocket. So that's the first part of an active site, is it's specifically binding some sort of substrate or substrates in the case where we have multiple, uh, multiple enzymes. So how do they do what they do? Uh, what we're seeing here are three things. I'm gonna see if I have enough room on the slide to write it rather than pulling up an extra note. But there's actually three things that are being discussed on this slide here. So how do enzymes lower the activation energy barrier? In our work, we can say, how do they do what they do? Okay, so first thing is something called the proximity effect. What does that mean? It means if you have two substrates, you can imagine if they were floating around in this room that I'm in here. You know, one of the substrates could be way over there on the other end of the room, and the other substrate could be over here by the door. Uh, they're never going to react until they're brought together. So that's what the proximity effect is. It means we're bringing our substrates together. So I will write that, bring substrates together. Okay, number two. Now, unfortunately, this was the best diagram I could find for you. Um, maybe next semester I'll find something a little bit better. Uh, B is actually representing something called the orientation effect, uh, which is maybe even better represented in A. Um, but uh, I'll tell you what the orientation effect means. Orientation effect. So we're going to try some different colors. I just don't know how to switch the colors in PowerPoint. I'm kind of getting a little tired of this red marker. Uh, so orientation effect. Uh, it's the same thing, uh, uh, very similar to the proximity effect. You bring things close together and you want to have them in the right orientation. So maybe picture this as, you know, in this room, this is a party or, or a dance or something like that. And you have a best friend and you want to set him or her up with some, somebody else. And, you know, the first part is getting them together, right? Maybe at the same table or, or, or something like that. The next part is getting them to actually face each other and talk each other with each other. So that's what the orientation 
uh, effect is all about is bringing things together in the right orientation. So we can say that. So bring So uh, I'm going to put closer for that first one. Closer together, bring substrates in correct orientation. Okay, so the third one is a little more tricky to think about. And uh, this is where, unfortunately, I have a demonstration as you usually show in class uh, that's a little harder to do. Um, you know, uh, remotely, uh, I, I, and I couldn't think of a creative way to do this, but uh, you can see it's, it's, it's shown there in that third diagram. And uh, I have a little uh, video I'll show you in a moment, uh, or a little animation I found on the internet that kind of shows this principle. And uh, so the third principle, we'll call it uh, bond bending or flexing. So, you know, if you've ever tried to, um, you know, assemble something or take something apart and, uh, you know, you have uh, two things stuck together, sometimes a way to get them apart or together is to kind of wiggle them a bit, right? And that's what's going on with bond bending and flexing, right? Sometimes it's harder to break something directly, whereas, you know, if you kind of wiggle it off, uh, and that's kind of what is going on from a chemical standpoint. Uh, not going to get into it any, uh, any more detail than that. Um, I'll show you a quick example here, like I said, in a moment. Uh, but you can also think of that as an alternate chemical pathway in that, uh, you know, sometimes we're breaking a bond. Uh, rather than breaking it, we're going to warp it first, and then we're, going to, then we're going to snap it off, you know, or wiggle a new atom in there or something like that. So let me show you a video here. I think I have it on the next slide. Um, I've got a little animation here. You can see this is showing lysosome, and uh, I want to point you to the uh, structure on the far left. So lysozyme breaks down peptide glycan, and what it's going to do is it wants to cut this bond right here. So this bond here, if you remember, uh, we were talking about cellulose and peptide glycan and all that. Uh, it's got a whole bunch of hydrogen bonds, so I'm going to just kind of draw some hydrogen bonds. Here we go, that are stabilizing that making it very hard for the water molecule to get in there and hydrolyze this particular reaction. So notice what happens in the second diagram here. What happens is the whole thing just gets warped a little bit. And that whole warping effect, it loosens the hydrogen bonds and allows the water molecule to get in there a lot easier. So I'll show you this animation here. Hopefully this is gonna play for me. I probably have to switch. Okay, it says internet reports that the item I requested could not be found. Awesome. Okay, I guess I'm not going to show you the animation. You just get to look at these wonderful pictures. Um, and it makes it a lot easier for the water molecule to get in. So this was kind of one of the better examples I could find. Um, there's a lot of these things that have been characterized, but, uh, you know, it can get very, very complex. And I didn't want to spend uh, half a lecture going through enzymatic mechanisms with you. So this will have to be good enough for now. So remember these three things, okay? How do they do what they do? They bring things close together, they orient them in the correct orientation for a reaction, and sometimes a little bit of bond wiggling or flexing or bending going on is helping them to uh, you know, bring that reaction to completion. There are more answers to this in this question, but this is about what we look at at this level. Okay, so a few other things to say about enzymes. Uh, one is that many enzymes have something called cofactors. So what is a cofactor? Co usually means there's something there that's being shared, right? Cooperation or, you know, you are co-parenting a child or whatever it is, right? Um, so cofactors are non-peptide things that are attached to that enzyme that are essential for some sort of function. So you can kind of put them into two groups. We can have ions, right? So inorganic ions, you probably recognize some of these things like calcium and magnesium. Uh, you know, and this is some of the reasons why we need a few of these things in our diets. And then there are things that are called coenzymes. Coenzymes include vitamins. So by vitamins, I mean things that we have to consume as part of our diet. So you might recognize some of these. We have riboflavin, we have biotin, and so on. 
And then there are some coenzymes that are non-vitamins, meaning these are things we don't have to consume. Our body makes them, but the enzyme needs them, right? So you can see, for example, heme is a molecule found in hemoglobin, and uh, along with iron, the heme and the iron are things in hemoglobin that uh, bind to the hemoglobin protein and help to uh, attach to oxygen. Okay, so quick test yourself question. It says true or false? Enzymes change the amount of free energy required for a reaction. So the answer to this is false. So remember, go back to that diagram I showed you before. We had reactants. And it kind of looked like this, and we had products down here. And the delta G is the difference between the reactants and the products. Now the enzyme may decrease the hump, but it doesn't change the starting and the endpoints. So enzymes do not change the free energy. Enzymes change this thing here, which is the energy of activation. Number two, true or false, a cofactor is made of amino acids. Okay, so we just talked about that a moment ago, right? Uh, I'll actually go back to that slide. So a cofactor, is a non-peptide part, right? So no, it's not made of amino acids. So this is false. It's anything but pretty much ions and uh, organic molecules, but just not amino acids because the amino acids is the protein part. Do I have a third one here? I don't remember. No, I don't. Okay, I wanna spend the last few minutes uh, talking about enzyme activity and how these things are inhibited and regulated. Uh, and we're going to come back to an example of enzyme regulation when we look at glycolysis. Uh, so you can see what it's showing here. It's saying that enzymes are kind of picky, meaning they have specific uh, physiological conditions where they're fully active. So at the top here, you can see what I'm looking at here is a curve. And this curve is showing what most human enzymes look like, right? They're optimally active at body temperature. So if I go all the way down, it's about 37 degrees Celsius there. Uh, and so that makes sense. There are enzymes with different optimal temperatures. Uh, for example, you can see on the right here, uh, bacteria that live in uh, really hot places uh, may have optimal uh, temperatures that are gonna be much higher than 37 degrees. Uh, most of our enzymes too uh, seem to hover around pH seven. You can see they're showing some examples here of, uh, of exceptions. So stomach enzymes, the optimal conditions are at low pHs and intestinal enzymes, uh, optimal pHs are much higher than seven neutral. So enzymes are picky. Enzymes are also found in special locations, meaning they're not necessarily gonna be active unless you know if you have a mitochondrial enzyme, it's not gonna be active until it's in the mitochondria and so on. So what I wanna talk about, like I said, for the last part of the lecture is regulating enzyme activity. And uh, one way that enzymes can be regulated is something called inhibition. So inhibition, inhibit, means to stop or prevent something. So I do have a short video to show you as well, but you can see that uh, there's different types of inhibitors. So if you take a look on the left, we've got an enzyme that is being bound by its substrate normally, and this can be blocked by inhibitor in a competitive way. So this little competitive inhibitor here it's in the active site and blocking the substrate. There are other types of inhibition called non-competitive. So you can see this non-competitive inhibitor here uh, actually binds to a different part of the molecule and prevents the substrate from binding to the active site. So a little bit different. So here's a short video. I will play this for you right now. Uh, I just gotta make sure the volume is on. It looks like it is. Okay, let's see if I can get this to play, oops. Where am I going? Okay, let's try that out. During the normal enzyme catalytic cycle, the substrate encounters an enzyme with a specific active site to which it binds, forming an enzyme substrate complex. The enzyme then facilitates the breakdown of the substrate to its products, which part from the enzyme, leaving the active site free to catalyze another substrate as the cycle begins again.
Competitive inhibition occurs when an enzyme encounters a blocker, which mimics the properties of the substrate and binds to the enzyme's active site. Thus, when the substrate is encountered, the active site is not available for attachment and no reaction will occur. Non-competitive enzyme inhibition involves the binding of a blocker to the enzyme away from the active site. This binding causes a conformational change in the enzyme, altering the shape of the active site, which prevents the substrate from binding. No reaction will occur as long as a non-competitive blocker is bound to the enzyme. Okay, that's it for the video. Sorry if it was a little quiet. I, I put the volume right to the max, uh, but you can check it out if you want to uh, take a look at this PowerPoint later. So why are we interested in inhibitors? Um, some of them are actually very dangerous. Uh, some inhibitors can kill us. Uh, here's an example of one inhibitor, it's called sarin. Uh, this is also called nerve gas. Uh, you can see uh, in 1995, there was a terrorist group in Japan who released some of this into a subway and killed a bunch of people. Um, so you can see it's, uh, it says here, it is inhibiting acetylcholine esterase. So acetylcholine esterase is a neurotransmitter. And uh, so serin, serin uh, blocks the recycling of that, which of course, you know, is not good for your nerves. Many inhibitors are actually uh, important drugs. So some of you may recognize this one here. You're probably looking at that and maybe it looks familiar. I encourage you, you know, you're all at an educational level now where, you know, reading your bottles, uh, you know, whether it's prescriptions or shampoo bottles uh, or the things you eat, uh, you can start to make sense of these. And some of you may recognize this one here. This is possibly the most prescribed or used medication on the planet for that and some of its derivatives. So derivatives like uh, acetaminophen or ibuprofen. Uh, and this binds to cyclooxygenase enzymes. So cyclooxygenase enzymes are involved in pain and inflammation. So again, a very useful uh, drug. And many inhibitors are drugs which are useful for us for medicine. Uh, here is um, a slide showing what competitive inhibition looks like. So if you take a look at this here, we've got thymidine. So thymidine is a uh, nucleoside, and it's the T for the A, G, C, and T of the genetic code. And uh, we have this drug here called A, Z, T. And uh, so it turns out that this is actually the first HIV drug that came out, I think it was the early 90s or late 80s. And uh, obviously people with HIV are very happy that this drug did come out. Uh, it, it binds an enzyme found in the virus competitively, and you can see it looks very similar to thymidine, uh, which makes it a very good drug, but then it doesn't go on to further reactions. Uh, here's another inhibitor that we had already talked about uh, way back in topic uh, four or five, we talked about penicillin. And what does penicillin do? Penicillin binds enzymes involved in peptidoglycan biosynthesis. So just a reminder of something we did talk about previously. So I want to kind of just talk about some more nuances of, um, of enzyme regulation, because uh, I was just talking about inhibition, and, and uh, now what I want to talk about a little bit more is regulation. And I'm going to give you an example of regulation, like I said, when we get to uh, glycolysis. And, uh, you can see what, what they're trying to show here is that a lot of enzymes, uh, you kind of think of them like the fingers on your hand, right? Um, you know, they're flexible, right? Sometimes my hand is open, sometimes it's closed, so maybe I'm playing catch or frisbee with somebody, and I can open my hand to catch it, and I close it at the right time. And So enzymes are kind of like that, and some forms are a little bit more ready or active than other forms. So a lot of uh, regulation does this kind of thing, right? It will stabilize an active form or a closed form or an inactive form. So if you stabilize an active form, it's called an activator. If you stabilize an inactive form, it's called an inhibitor. So we are gonna talk about an enzyme uh, in glycolysis called phosphofructokinase. Phosphofructokinase. We're gonna talk about that when we get to glycolysis uh, in a little bit of detail. Uh, the short form is PFK, and probably some people are laughing at that because, of course, that's the uh, French acronym for KFC, for Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, so it's a good way to remember what it is, phosphofructokinase. We're going to talk about that. 
Today we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, another example of, of how this kind of thing might work. And you have probably talked about these uh, feedback uh, pathways in, in high school a little bit. And I'm just going to give you an example now of, uh, of a pathway that occurs for an amino acid synthesis pathway. So if you take a look at this, we're starting off with something called threonine. That's an amino acid. And we are synthesizing isoleucine. So this is, uh, involves five enzymes. Uh, it's a pathway uh, with uh, several intermediates. So you've got enzyme one, two, three, four, and five. So we've got some sort of metabolic, path metabolic pathway and there's some feedback inhibition that occurs in this pathway. So how does this work? Is that the end product, isoleucine, actually binds to this enzyme here, right? This three amine deaminase. And it, it actually binds it uh, in a non-competitive way. So we call this allosteric. Uh, it binds to another part of the enzyme and prevents threonine from binding. And so the pathway is shut down. So this is called feedback inhibition. And why do we do this? Well, if you have enough isoleucine, we don't want to make more isoleucine. So let's stop making it. Let's shut down the entire pathway. In fact, you know, why waste any steps? Let's go back and stop it right at the very first step. So that's feedback inhibition. It does it in an allosteric way. And like I said, we're going to talk about the example of phosphofructokinase the next day. Uh, I don't think I have enough time to talk about it today. Um, if there's enough iso, if the isoleucine gets used up, you can see it's popping off the enzyme there. The pathway reopens and it happens again. So I am looking at the time and maybe what I will do so did I bring my notes is the real question. And the answer is maybe no. I was going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about fossil fructokinase, but I have to have a note first, which is here somewhere. And I'm going to draw you a little picture showing uh, how this might work, assuming I have a note. <laughs> and I don't think, oh, maybe I do. Oh, there it is, yeah. So we have a few minutes, I wanna talk about fossil fructokinase, and that's kind of, uh, kind of the end of today's lecture. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to that whiteboard. I'm gonna start a new whiteboard, and uh, I'll share that with you in a second here. I'll stare at great. Okay, so. New share, and where is it? There it is. Okay, so I'm calling this allosteric regulation in glycolysis. So glycolysis starts off with glucose. You probably know that part. Remember that from high school. And there are a couple of steps. And then we're making something called fructose 6-phosphate. And then fructose 6-phosphate is made into something called fructose 1,6-diphosphate. That's two phosphates. And there's a whole bunch of other steps. Eventually, it makes something called PEP. And then eventually, it makes pyruvate. Okay, I'm trying to be super neat here. It is not easy on this computer screen, but there's our glycolysis in a very quick nutshell. And right here in this reaction is what we want to talk about. This is where phosphofructokinase does its stuff. So this is where it catalyzes the reaction. Right in there. Okay, so what do we want to talk about? We want to talk about regulation in glycolysis. So that previous reaction I showed you before was right at the beginning of the pathway. This doesn't happen quite at the beginning of the pathway. It's close to the beginning. Uh, why not at the beginning? Because we don't just eat glucose. All right, I hope at least you don't just eat glucose. That's probably not very good for you if that's uh, all you have in your diet. Uh, 
But uh, so it's near the beginning, which is a little bit more efficient in terms of what we're trying to do. So one thing I want to show you is I, I, why I mentioned this PEP. So PEP, you're probably wondering what that stands for. That is phosphoenol pyruvate. Um, and so that actually is an inhibitor. So we've got some feedback inhibition here. So there we go. My dotted line. I'm just going to put a negative to show that it's an inhibitor. And I'll write a note there, allosteric inhibitor. So something else that you probably know about glycolysis is that glycolysis produces ATP. So it turns out that ATP is also a negative inhibitor. So I'm not going to write out allosteric inhibitor all over again. Uh, that's what the negative sign is for. Um, so how do we turn this pathway on? So it turns out that if we have lots of ATP, we don't have a lot of ADP. But if we've used up a lot of our ATP, then we have a lot of ADP. So ADP is an activator. So I'm going to put a plus sign there, so allosteric activator. So I'm going to just shrink this just a little bit, and I'm going to write a note here on the side, kind of summarizing what I'm trying to stay, say here. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is, so if the concentration of ADP is high, what does this mean? This means that the concentration of ATP is low. So our cells want ATP. So this means we've got to turn on glycolysis and we've got to make more ATP. So I'll write that. It means cell needs more glycolysis. And then it upregulates upregulates means turns on, and I'm just going to use the abbreviation phosphofructokinase. So the last note is what if what if PEP or concentration of ATP are high. So this means here we have enough ATP and other glycolysis products. The cell wants to turn it off. The cell needs to turn it off, needs to turn off glycolysis. So, and therefore it down regulates the enzyme. Down regulates phosphofructokinase. Okay, so hopefully that made some sense. Okay, I am gonna, we're gonna come back to glycolysis uh, next day, in fact. So we will come back and kind of revisit this concept about phosphofructokinase being a regulation. Uh, an enzyme involved in the regulation of glycolysis. And uh, like I said, you know, these last couple of units, I'm just trying to get you up to speed and talk about a whole bunch of things that are going to be important for the next couple of topics. So things like ATP, things like delta G, uh, what is an enzyme? What happens, you know, what's a substrate? You know, uh, what is this, you know, and, and looking at enzymes in ways where you see things, you know, phosphofructokinase. So fructo means it's, you know, it's acting on fructose and so on. Um, so just trying to give you some of the language and tools to kind of understand uh, the next couple of topics. So respiration and photosynthesis, uh, both of those are about two lectures each and they're a pretty major part of the second part of this course. Uh, so um, I know a lot of people are very scared of all these chemical reactions. 
uh, and I'll try to, as we bring you through them, I'll let you know, uh, you know, what is important stuff and what is, uh, you know, less important, right? Uh, so that you know how to approach studying for this. So I think we are out of time, it looks like. And uh, so I'm going to finish there. Uh, like I said, hopefully you got all that and uh, have a bit of an understanding about it. You can definitely expect a question or two uh, about this on, on the next midterm. Um, won't be a long answer question, but uh, definitely some sort of short answer or multiple choice. So hopefully you all have a great day and uh, I will catch you on Friday.